Regarding your relationship with Linkin Park, if I'm not mistaken, Chester Bennington was the first member of Linkin Park that you got to meet, correct? First guy I met, and it was it was at, at NRG. We were just standing out front. Um, I don't know what I was doing out there, maybe taking a break. Um, and I don't even know what I was working on. I, I produced Gavin Rossdale's first solo album, and I worked on a couple of Helmet albums there, and I worked uh, with another band there. Uh, and, and also with my friend John Tempesta and Chris Trainer, we worked there. But uh, I, I might I used to smoke cigarettes, I think. Yeah, I, I could have gone out to smoke a cigarette because I don't really smoke weed twice a year. Um, and he was smoking a joint, and we just said, hey, you know. And they were working on... It was early on. I know they had one record. They were already huge. Um, so it was either second or second. Huh? This was after Hybrid Theory? Is that the first album? Yeah. 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 It was, uh, they were, they had already sold a, a, like 10 million records or whatever. And they, when I was at the studio, they had put in, there were concerns about security for people stealing music when that, all the downloading thing was, you know, it was all the rage. Uh, and so they had put special doors in. So they're, cause they were in, um, a, I believe that, that and so they kind of made their own little worlds. Uh, and I was working in B, and then Jay mixes in C. That's kind of his main mixing room. But uh, uh, so I just went to take a break, and Chester was taking a break. We said, "Hey, that was that was kind of it. It was a it was a you know five minute conversation about nothing." Um, then uh, years later, they, as I said, their my manager said, "Hey, Lincoln Park want, would love you to play and sing on their new record." And I'm like, "Oh, that'd be that'd be a blast." Because I had heard that they were fans and um, had said good things about Helmet and stuff. And so I um, went in. Chester wasn't there. Mike and um, Brad were there. Yeah, so we just kind of chatted. And they played me some stuff. Um, and I said, uh, I said, I could hear something on that. You know, that, that like would, would work. Um, so they just sent me tracks. And I went home and learned the tune. Um, and I... I Oddly enough, my, my Bradshaw rig that I used at the time that now lives in Europe and I have a new, a different Bradshaw rig for the U.S., there were some, some uh, uh, technical issues with it. I couldn't get my effects to work, so I just ended up playing like chordal things. I superimposed some things on top of what they were doing. Uh, and I don't, if I remember correctly, they didn't use a lot of it. They used kind of so the more basic stuff I did. Uh, like a, I think a melodic distorted thing. And then, uh, and then I went and sang, I did probably, uh, I want to say maybe I did three takes on this, on the vocal. Um, maybe more, I, I didn't sing for more than an hour. Uh, and I didn't play for more than an hour. We mostly just hung and, uh, it was cool. It was fun. Really. It was interesting, um, to, to work like that. Cause Mike, uh, uh, Shinoda and I were, t we talked about, you know, I, talked about how I work is I, I make an arrangement, write the song and go in and teach it to the band. And then we play it live. They put everything together in the studio and the computer, and then they have to learn it afterwards. So it's a completely different way of working. Um, and, uh, I, I just really like the, I like the ebb and flow that can happen, even though we play the click tracks now of playing with my drummer live, you know, so then I'll, I'll redo my guitar um, and then um, add the second guitar and, and bring the bass in and do the vocals or whatever. But it was fun. It was a, it was a, it was, I learned a lot. It was cool. That is unique. So you're saying that they basically digitized the music before they actually learned how to play it analog. Is that kind of what you were saying? Well, they, yeah, they, they put it kind of together in the studio, so to speak, or like whatever they do at home. They're all, I think they're all like computer geniuses from what I can tell, like they do any, anything with the computer so they put it together kind of constructed and uh, i'm not we were i believe we were using pro tools in the studio uh i use logic audio at home for movie stuff and for helmet writing and for um i'm writing a piece for the christian brothers high school you know orchestral piece and i just do everything in logic with contact and uh um you know my plugins and stuff so but they do it all they do write it all there in the computer and then so after the kind of arrangements done um, and the songs recorded, then they then they learn the songs for the set, so they can do their live set. I mean, that's that's the way I under, understood it anyway. Rather than coming in with a complete arrangement on the guitar, I could come in and, with a complete arrangement on the guitar and play it for the band. That's how I that's how I go about it. So kind of still a little slightly old fashioned, but I use computers, you know. So that's so cool. And do you know if uh, Chester would have his lyrics ready before the music came in, or was it like? Based after that, I couldn't tell you. On this particular song, Mike was singing uh, lead vocals on the chorus, 
uh, and then Chester had his, because uh, nobody can do what Chester does, obviously. He was doing the intense uh, parts uh, um, on, that, on the chorus. So Mike and I were doubling on the melody. Uh, so I was just singing exactly. So I, I'm assuming that, you know, Mike wrote those lyrics, um, but I don't know. I didn't ask him about their their writing process as a band. Uh, uh, and then Mike, Mike and Brad were there for all the all the sessions. Uh, those were the two main guys that were there while I was there. Uh, and then when I did a show with them for their um, music for relief, um, uh, I got together with their tech because I there you know I said was it cool if I just use your guys' gear. So I had to bring a guitar and an amp, uh, and they were like, "That's great." So I, I had a guitar, and I got with their tech, and they programmed, I programmed a couple of sounds in a, I think I want to say it was a fractal or something like that. This guitar system, because uh, they're not their stage volume is not loud. They they go everything's run through, you know, uh, the the in ear monitors, um, and and helmet stage sound is very loud. Um, because that's part of how I get some of the feedback and some of the response between the guitar and the pickup and the and the speakers and the and the amp head. It's all kind of connected to me. So um, uh, it was it was interesting. It was fun. that was fun. I had, I kind of just went, I didn't really have time, um, so I kind of went through the songs quickly. And then when we did a sound check, I was like, man, I I got to sit. And they had a trailer for me that I shared with the guy from. Uh, no doubt, and the guy from Blink One Eighty Two. So I was in there. It's like I better really brush up on these songs before I do the gig, before I do the gig. So I went in and and memorized the stuff. I wrote, you know, so so I wouldn't have to write anything down. But uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. Where I'm like, yeah, I'll do it, no problem. And then I got there. I'm like, I can learn. I, you know, I was overconfident. I can learn anything. I can, I can do anything. It's like, well, wait a minute. You better learn. You know where this change happens because it was kind of a modal thing and. Uh, so yeah, it was fun. It was really, really a blast. When Chester and I got to hang, um, in between where there was a kind of outdoor area, like, uh, for, for the band and crew, uh, folks, and my friend Rob Pryor, actually a great artist who I'm, I'm scoring a movie for right now called Paint of Beauty. He was there and I'm like, what the hell are you doing here? And he was painting cause he can paint and draw, uh, with his right and left hand simultaneously. Like it's uh, this, uh, he's a freak. He's just absolute phenomenal artist. We had worked together years ago and he did the seeing eye dog, uh, al uh album cover for helmet. Uh, and he did, he did some guitars, some custom guitars for us for ESP that we donated to, uh, some uh, kids music schools and stuff. Uh, so that was cool to get to see him. But yeah, Chester and I hung out, had to share some laughs and then went up and did my stuff. I, uh, one song, I, uh, I wish I'm, I'm so bad with titles, but, uh, I did one song and then, Split for a while, and then came back and did uh, the very last song. I think uh, is what it, how, is how it worked. So, um, yeah, it was fun, really fun. That's cool. And how long, um, in general, like uh, did it take for them to make that record? Do you know? The hunting party. Yeah. Gosh, I I, I don't know. Um, I'm gonna guess it was around uh, around a year, maybe something like that. Uh, and okay. they, you know, they also bought in another uh, he, uh, hero, uh, uh, Rakim. You know, for Eric B and uh, Rakim, uh, who are fen you know phenomenal, um, you know old old school, I guess you call it rap guys, and he was on the album as well. They're they're so great, paid in full. Uh, you follow the leader. That stuff's heavy as shit, man. So cool. It's really it's cool. Do you know why um, Lincoln Park when they released One More Light, they got a ton of backlash for going you know a bit poppier. For me personally, I feel like if you're an artist, you're allowed to explore different musical avenues, but a lot of people were not happy with that record. Um, do you know why they went in that direction by any chance? I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know if they um, if they were, you know, they just were interested in doing some something poppy or if they were concerned with trying to have a hit or if they let, you know, I, I don't I don't I think at that point they didn't need to do anything that anybody else thought they should do. So I'm a, I can only assume that they made the album they wanted to make, you know, um, I I'll do, so I'll have a complete noise fest on one song and something that's, I think hooky and accessible in the next song. I don't have, I don't feel like you should limit yourself, um, you know, and just do what you want to do. Is the, is the whole album po uh, popular? I'll be honest <laughs> with you. I haven't listened to that whole record. All the songs yeah. I've heard from it are popular. Um, yeah. But again, I think it comes down to intention. Like, 
if the band is putting that record out there because that's how they want to express themselves, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, I would think that they they would just do what they what they felt like doing. I mean, I uh, I do like as a you know as a writer and a singer and a guitarist and a producer, I, I've worked on like such a wide variety of stuff, and I love some stuff that's poppy, and I also love stuff that's you know completely inaccessible, you know, and and. Uh, you know, to most people, like I, what's in, what's accessible to me would not be accessible to my fourteen-year-old niece. You know, she'd just be like, "Ah, oh, Uncle Page, what the hell is this?" You know. From your experience, what was Chester Bennington like as a person? How was he to be around? You know, the little t- little time I hung with them, he was he was funny, very, uh, very funny, and I, I can't get into some of the stuff we talked about because it's you know, cause there was some funny shit. But uh, he was just really not really really nice. You know, I just seemed. To me, for a guy that was as popular and famous as he was, he, he was seemed pretty unassuming, you know. I'm just an old, I mean, I'm an old, you know, rock fart that a lot of younger guys, you know, grew up listening to. So, uh, you know, maybe his he was different around me than he was around other people. But with me, just, you know, I was I felt really comfortable. And, you know, we just hung, you know, hung and talked and laughed. And that, that, that's kind of kind of it. And then I went back to kind of go to my trailer and do my thing. So, and on stage, it was fun. And he, you know, he sounded great and and people loved it. And it was, it was cool. So I I can't say, Hey, we were, you know, close buds hanging out all the time. We just had a, you know, a few experiences. And when I first met him, I said at the, at the studio, it was nice. And, um, it was really, seemed really young. I go, this kid's young. Man. <laughs> it struck me when I, you know, saw him outside there and he told me who he was. It's like, I mean, yeah, I'm Lincoln Park. I'm like, oh yeah, you guys, because I didn't know any, you know. This was back anything. in 2000? Back in whenever, whenever I met, yeah, when I ever met him outside smoking a joint, it was, because uh, uh, I'm still listening to Thelonious Monk and I didn't really know what those guys look like or anything. I don't, I didn't have a TV, uh, TV set, so I didn't see MTV, so um yeah, then I knew what they looked like when I saw them around, and uh, yeah, they. By the time I played with them, they'd grown up a lot. Cause that was, when was that uh, hunting party? Twenty fourteen, it was released. Twenty fourteen, wow. Yeah, so that so would have been fourteen years since they, uh, since they uh, started or whatever. They did they start in like the late nineties? They started in I think the mid nineties, but Hybrid Theory, their first record was released in two thousand. Yeah, I mean that's what I'm assuming. The, that record had been out, so they were working on a, a new record. Don't quote me on the the time frame. Yeah, I, I just knew that they were working on a, a, a new record and it was very early on. And, and, and uh, yeah. That's so cool. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I've always admired about Chester, even though I've never met him, is, you know, he was one of the most famous rock stars ever, really. But he always seemed like a super down-to-earth, chill guy. Is that is that how he came across? Yeah, as I said, to me, you know, I, I can't speak to his relationship with fans or anybody else but to me he was really nice and we were uh we were playing a festival in baltimore uh or maryland or outside of baltimore maybe uh and he was singing with stone temple pilots and um he got up on stage in front of twenty thousand people and said uh, started uh, you know saying how amazing helmet is and you should support that band and and uh they're they're they changed music for all he said really kind things i was backstage and the band's like, yeah, Chester's talking about us and just saying really, really nice things. I saw that, that to me, he didn't have to do. He didn't have to do that. You know, he didn't have to say anything about us. He was, you know, playing with another multi-platinum band. You know, and uh, you know, and, I, and I had met the brothers Robert and Dean years ago. They were really good, good guys um, in Seattle because I was mixing the Helmet album Aftertaste with Terry Date, and they were playing a show, so they invited me to the show. Um, I was with our label pres and we went to see them play and he knew him because he was their, their eighth grade math teacher in New Jersey. Um, so that was kind of another interesting story. But there's Chester, you know, um, singing, singing and playing and, and you know, uh, giving my band props. I, I, you know, that, that goes a long way with me. You know what I mean? It's just I think it's cool. It's really uh, it's, it's cool. You know, I've found over the over the years, all the people that I've met, been fortunate to meet that are some of my heroes, and I got to play, you know, lead guitar with David Bowie, and I and I hung with uh, hung with Neil Young, and I've hung with Billy Gibbons a couple of times, and um, all those guys who are amazing musicians and, and had a big impact on me were down to earth and really really nice, like really good, cool, no attitude, no bullshit. Um, I can say that to like if someone's a great artist, they don't need to be a dick, you know. And I, I mean, I'm not, I've, I used to date, I dated a couple of actresses, really famous, 
met Steve Martin at a party and he was the same way. He was like, Paige, that's an interesting name. It's like, you know, where'd your parents come up with that? I was like, you know, just I'm having, he's having hors d'oeuvres and I'm having a beer and it's like, he's an amazing. He's, he's like such a great comedian. I loved him when I was a little kid. I always loved, and he's, he doesn't have to be a dick, you know? And, and some of the guys that are maybe less talented and, but they're famous and rich rock stars and they're kind of dicks. Cause, cause they're insecure, maybe I don't know. But people I know that are secure in their who they are as an artist and, and as a as a person, they're 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 nice. They they tend to be nice people, you know. And that's not to say that we all haven't done stupid things. And you know, I had a kid come up to me years ago and said, uh, God, after a show, and I always stop after show and sign stuff and talk to everybody because I don't just do much on social media. He said, "Man, I met you." Uh, I tried to talk to you a couple of years ago, but you had the flu and you just went, ran past me and went to the bus. And I'm like, I had the flu and I still, and I still played the show. I remember, I remember trying to not throw up on stage and I played the show. So I'm sorry. He's like, he's like, you're really cool. I didn't think you were cool, but you're really cool. And I'm like, okay, well, I apologize for having the flu and being a dick or whatever. You know, so it's like, you, 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 yeah, you never know. You know, you never know. You, we all have our moments, but in general, like I'm, I like talking to people and I like hearing that they saw us in 92 or they saw us open for faith no more, or they saw us, you know, whatever, or they, you know, it's, I, I, I like that. It's cause I, if I could talk to my heroes, those are things I would say. And when I, you know, met Bowie the first time, he was so cool. And I had a copy of a hunky dory in my back pocket for him to sign, you know, and he, he, you know, cause I knew I was going to be at the festival with him and he was gracious and great. And two years later called me to play lead guitar with him. So, um, you know, yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, I got the same vibe from 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 uh, Chester, and my experience is really nice, nice dude. I'm actually friends with his uh, first wife, and uh, I'm I'm actually, I'm actually coincidentally seeing her tomorrow for dinner. Um, lo lovely, lovely girl. She's been through you know a lot, and their son uh, Chester's son Draven. I feel so bad for all for his family, for everyone, his kids and stuff. Because uh, it's just a crushing thing. You don't know what, what uh, uh, you know, uh, puts a person in that uh, spot to feel that's the only solution. But uh, it's uh, it's uh, so sad, and it's just a you know loss of a nice human and a great talent. So it's a uh, uh, yeah. If I may ask, this is a personal question, so you don't have to answer if you don't want to. But how did you react to the news of Chester Bennington? Was it a surprise to you? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because I was like, I just had this image of, you know, of, of this nice dude that we that was funny and seemed happy to me. He seemed like really like happy and confident and, and you know, as an artist and and you know content with it. To me, it just he, he wasn't. Uh, he, like I say he wasn't a jerk. He wasn't didn't seem intimidated by me or whatever, you know. And and it, it's just cool. Like so, I was really shocked. You know, I had no idea. You don't. I just you have no idea what someone's going through though you know and and uh you know I, I i i hear this and i hear all this stuff about you know from medication to the various things that you know may have played a role in this and i'm not a i'm not a psychiatrist and i'm not a pharmacist i don't and i don't you know i can't begin to understand you know i had my very very dear sweet cousin um committed suicide last christmas uh and it, it was she was it wasn't wasn't even thirty uh, wasn't even forty years old yet. She was mid thirties, and I didn't know she was in such pain. You know, I, I mean, I just she was my sweet little cousin that I've known since she was, you know, knee high to a grasshopper, and uh, it's just devastating to to all of us, uh, the whole family. We all have suffered. And her parents, I, it's it's an off it's an awful thing to come to terms with. You know? well, first of all, I'm very sorry for your loss. I hope you know you know God rest her soul. I hope she's okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, do you know if, uh, like for me, one of the reasons I gravitate towards uh, rock and roll more than, you know, other genres is, I mean, every genre has its place, but I just find rock and roll is that one genre that really doesn't shy away from talking about things like suicide and darker subjects. The magic that happens with music, I, I never want that to be to be lost. Music as yeah. a, as a, there's nothing wrong with music as an escape 
and as a unifying force that we've talked about, uh, you know, uh, so far, it, it, you know, today, it's that's it doesn't always have to have you don't have to always have a purpose is what I'm saying. You know, what I mean, and your purpose might be to express something honest. And what you're saying there, uh, it's like being honest and expressing something that's true was truly painful. That's that is 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 it's going to help people somehow it's going to yeah. he's like i can relate to that i had a i had a 16 year old girl write me a letter about the song unsung and she was going to commit suicide because she was heartbroken over a boy and she heard unsung and decided not to and i i i got so choked up i was like i didn't write it thinking any it was uh, uh, that kind of response i i and so to me it was like wow that uh, you know you do have you realize that there that you are reaching people, you know, because my intentions were honest. I had this stream of conscious approach to this song, and and I wanted to you know sing about something. And and one kid wrote me a letter, and I, that's you know if one kid writes you a letter, that's that means the world. So um, you hope people will be honest in their songwriting. Yeah, I agree. So in terms of Lincoln Park's future. Of course, Chester Bennington's death deeply affected everyone, but interestingly, Linkin Park didn't break up. They're still together, so would you happen to know if the band intends on putting out new music at some point? I don't know. The last contact I had with uh, Mike and Brad was uh, af- uh, was kind of after Chester's um, death. I, all I did was send my condolences because that's it's not appropriate to, you know, to do anything else at that point because we've all you know been you know been through gr- grieving and you know the, losing loved ones and uh and they were both just thankful about it and then and they invited me to the to his m- memorial service um and I, I was i had planned to go and then i heard it was a big you know three ring circus like vip list thing and i and i was in the middle of a movie so i i ended up not being able to attend which i felt bad about but i sent my condolences again and um that's there's i don't i don't know what they've planned or what they're gonna what they're gonna do um i think they should continue you know um it's to and to to honor chester uh, and that's why i wanted to be a part of the gray days thing It, it i felt i felt honored that they asked me to to play and and i didn't ask you know somebody said oh they're paying everybody so much money and i'm like i'm not no I'm not taking money. I just, you know, I, I got, I get, have my guitar on, on a, a beautiful song with this beautiful voice and this, you know, dude that was really cool to me. And that's, that's all that, you know, for me, that's all I, uh, you know, I felt, you know, happy to, to, to be part of it. That's, that's it. So Paige, what inspired you to pursue music as a career? Uh, would I'd have to have to go to Led Zeppelin? I used to fantasize about being Jimmy Page. I would lay, I would put this the, the old crappy Radio Shack speakers by my head, and while my family was in watching the Love Boat, mom and dad, my brother and sister, and I was like, go, kind of going inside the music. Uh, in the light, I remember was one song that I I could not stop listening to, and uh, I just started thinking like, it occurred to me like I could learn the guitar. <laughs> like the guitar is so cool. So I did. I got a I got a forty dollar acoustic guitar and uh, took a lesson from a guy named Dennis Flenner and then ended up with a guy named Brad Sorensen, the guy that wouldn't teach me Stairway to Heaven, to the guy that would, and just kind of went from there. I didn't know I was going to make a career out of it, um, but I became so kind of obsessed that I I I got to this point where I, I my, my first girlfriend I didn't have a girlfriend until I was nineteen and I broke up with her so I could practice 12 hours a day it was zep and then all the music that i got turned on to after that you know with miles davis to john coltrane and felonious monk and bill evans and jim hall and wes montgomery and charlie parker and lee morgan and wayne shorter and weather report and it's just oh, i just and then but then i got into bob marley and the abyssinians and then i got turned on to them i got turned on to like massive attack and portishead you know, it's just all connected. You know what I mean? You've got Horace Andy singing on a Massive Attack song, the great reggae singer. It's like there's all this amazing music, and I can, I, I know I'm gonna be on my deathbed going like, I just didn't get it all done, you know. And I have all these goals and that I'm, I'm trying to, to do musically. There's so much you can do with music, and I'm, it's, it's exciting. So it's, I still feel like today is there's as much ahead of me as there was when I first started, you know. So hopefully I'll hopefully I'll, you know, make another 10 years, 15 years on earth and be able to do it all. So we'll see. 
hopefully even longer. <laughs> so uh, take me through your musical journey. How did you get to where you are? Born in Portland, folks moved to Medford. I got a guitar teacher when I was, not till I was uh, 17, I started really late. Um, and it just took to it. I loved it. Ended up going to University of Oregon as a pre-med major, and that was a disaster. Um, so I told my parents I was going to study music. Went to the community college there, Lane Community College. Got Learned to read uh, music. Um, auditioned on classical and jazz guitar. Got in, got my degree. Decided I had to live in New York because that's where Coltrane, Monk, and Bird lived. And I'm um, all my jazz heroes. Uh, got into Manhattan School of Music uh, on the grad program, jazz guitar, and finished that in 87. Uh, just started auditioning for bands. I play. I auditioned for everything I could find in the Village Voice. Um, ended up in the band of Susans, which was really fun, and also with Glenn Branca, the Glenn Branca Ensemble. So two things kind of simultaneously. And then through band of Susans, I played with Reese Chatham, and they kind of those guys turned me on to all this open tuning stuff and music like Wire and Killing Joke and Gang of Four and um, the Buzzcocks and the Undertones. And I started seeing concerts and was just loving. I, I was kind of done with rock. When, uh, when Boston, Foreigner, and Journey and all, and all that stuff came out when I was in high school. Because I like I like Zepp and ACDC. Wasn't so into that poppier stuff. Uh, but then I was like, Gang of Four, yeah. So um, I formed the band in 89 um, after I left Band of Susans. And uh, we, uh, we uh, were together about two years when we signed with Interscope. We, were, we had done a record for um, Amphetamine Reptile called Strap It On. And they just kind of took off. And, and uh, it, was, it was a good... Good, almost ten-year run with the with the guys, and I think, as happens in many bands, we uh, we just kind of you know parted ways. I ended up with the you know I got a great call one day from David Bowie, and he I played guitar with him, which pretty much kind of pulled I had to pull my head out of my ass because he, uh, I you know I had to learn thirty Bowie songs in two weeks, and then go play Saturday Night Live and Conan and uh, Wembley Stadium for the Net Aid concert. And that was amazing, really great experience. And then I decided to move to L.A. Um, and started jam with the uh, guy that I met named John Tempesta, Interscope, Iovine, Jimmy Iovine phone, make another Helmet record. Long story short, Helmet kind of essentially reunited with me as the only original member. So um, it was pressure because of the, the legacy of the band. And I didn't I wasn't aware that the band was held in, in such high esteem by people after seven years. And um, but ended up loving I'm loving I have more fun now than I than I ever did I love my bandmates uh, you know, I got I have a bunch of guys that are about 15 16 years younger than me uh, Kyle Stevenson amazing drummer Dan Beeman amazing guitar player and Dave Case a great bass player from um, so we still tour we actually had uh, the 30th anniversary tour last year we did 30 shows in Europe 30 in the US and we were headed to Australia New Zealand Japan when the pandemic hit so for the same yeah. same tour so that was that's been rebooked for November. It looks like that's getting moved again, and we've we've had all this stuff canceled this year, obviously, as everyone has. So um, I'm at home working on jazz stuff, and you know, playing you know this, and I uh, scored a movie. Uh, Les Paul. Yeah, I'm playing my Les Paul lately. Um, I scored a movie called Painted Beauty. Um, we have another movie in the pipe, but they can't film right now. Um, trying to think what else. I'm just, I'm going to work for School of Rock, which is a great organization that that has yeah. like thirty thousand kids around the country. I've done clinics for them before uh, in Portland and, te and somewhere in Texas and Boise, Idaho. And, um, and I really like the way they approach it. And it's it's a great thing for kids to get, you know, we didn't have anything like that. I was kind of like, here's a record, learn it, you know, jam with your friends, you know. So I really, really love that. And then I'm going to doing some some other things that produce stuff. I've produced some stuff for people online where they send me the tracks and I work them, work on them. So I was working on a movie, I think, called Inherit the Viper. And I, I played guitar at sessions on the, you know, the Kissing Booth movie, the, the, the yeah. teen, teen, yeah, I played on that. And the second one, we're starting the third one soon, the music. So it's fun. It's a whole different thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with, you know, with going in and playing, adding, you know, stuff to other people's music. I've done a lot for the uh, great film composer, com great composer, Elliot Goldenthal, who's done, uh, he won an Academy Award for Frida. I've played on a, a bunch of his scores. Uh, Titus, The Tempest, The Good Thief, Across the Universe, um, uh, Heat, the movie Heat. Um, and he really? That's yeah, good yeah, it's cool. Really cool guitar stuff. They brought me in years ago because um, the person, uh, one person, Tim Carr, who was a great A and R person at Warner Brothers, had tried to sign Helmet, and we ended up going with Interscope. But he was still a fan, and they were, I believe, they were doing the soundtrack for Heat. 
So he, uh, he said, Elliot was looking for something new and different. So I've done a lot. I've done, probably done 20 movies with him. I did a Nick Nolte movie called The Good Thief. We did a song with uh, Bono from U2 that was really fun. I uh, did a Sinatra made famous called That's Life. So that was kind of another experience. And I've always put music first, always. Um, I never, I was never worried about an audience. I was never worried about the response. I was never worried about what someone thought. Um, you, people are going to hurt your feelings regardless. You could make the best album, and you know, ever. And there's somebody out there that doesn't like Led Zeppelin. You know what I mean? Or doesn't like yeah. Back in Black. I mean, you, there's nothing you can do about it. And, and I can't explain to them. Well, you're that's your flaw. I had a friend who's, who's like, I don't like Hendrix. I'm like, well, you better educate yourself then, because he, you know. He's the greatest electric guitar player, you know, in, in rock ever. And he changed the, he changed music and the instrument for us. So um, I just I approach it as a musician. I, that's why I love jazz music. It was always drop the needle. And I didn't really know I could see the cool photo of Coltrane on the cover of Blue Train. Or I could see find now we can find video footage of all of these guys and see him playing and see him see him uh, in person. And I've watched a lot of documentaries during the pandemic and learn things that I didn't necessarily want to know about some of my heroes. I knew Charlie Parker died young and had a bad heroin addict, uh, addiction, and I knew that Miles had a heroin addiction. I knew that Lee Morgan had a heroin addiction. I knew that Train did. And you know that these guys have been through hell and back. But uh, Billie Holiday, that God, she just she was prostit you know, put into prostitution at 14. She just had a hellish life. But the music was was what grounded them. They always had this, and that's I all I love those people because the music it, it reaches me. When I went to see I went to see Elvin Jones, Coltrane's uh, amazing drummer from his quartet with McCoy Tyner and Jimmy Garrison, and then later Reggie Workman or Reggie Workman first, and then Jimmy. Uh, and I was so blown away standing on the side of the little stage there at the Village Vanguard, and I don't know what I was doing if I had tears in my eyes or if I was just looking stupid. But Elvin came up put his arms around me and, and hugged me. And I just got this feeling like he knew that I was completely blown away by what I had just heard and seen. And he just was, he was like, yeah, this kid is standing here just like flipping out. And it was just this amazing thing that music brings us together. It bring, it, 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 and so yeah. if you worry about, well, you know, what's my next move or what's my response, you know, what's, how are people going to respond to this? Do what you believe in and be honest. I tell every kid, I do a lot of clinics and I work with kids at rock camps. I'm going to do this thing with the School of Rock. Um, do Be honest with yourself. Do something you love and you believe in, you know? Um, and I'm, te I'm a terrible business person. I've lost so much money and, you know, divorced and spent money, you know, foolishly and I never th really thought. I've been ripped off by labels, by you know, other business people. And if I sat around and was bitter about it, I would be miserable, you know what I mean? But here I am today, I'm working on a Coltrane tune called Spiral from the Giant Steps album. I'm going to do, I did a couple solo jazz guitar things for the Brit Festival folks who have, it's a, my hometown in Medford, Oregon. There's a festival called the Brit Festival in um, Jacksonville. It's a hundred year old classical festival. And I've been, been honored to be able to play with the orchestra, Teddy Abrams, a, a few times. And, um, so I said, can you send us some stuff? We're just putting stuff up. So I did a you know a couple little jazz tunes, and I'm working on a couple other things for them. And and uh, I think like just doing what you doing what you love and making it about you know making it about um, about music and why you know when I was ten years old, I heard a horse with no name from America, and it cured me from car sickness. And I'm like, what? That's kind of magic. What music has that much? power and i've always tried to maintain that enthusiasm about it and i still feel that way I'm, i just turned 60 in may and i'm still i still love i just did a lesson for a nine-year-old last week and to see just that little moment where something clicked you know and, and trying to figure out how to communicate this fretboard thing to a nine-year-old who's never touched a guitar before and i love that i still love that i love that the, i remember um working with the Brit Festival, and there's a kid, Ryan, kept stepping on his guitar cable and unplugging his guitar. I showed him how to just put it through his guitar strap and plug it in, and just that look of, what, what, you know, on his face, it made me, it makes me so, it makes me so happy, you know, and, and I've had people write me and say, man, I, you turned me on to John Coltrane, or I had no idea, you know, jazz, the drum kit came from jazz guys inventing a way for one guy to play the kick, snare, and the cymbals together, you know, and 
um, that, you know, this music, there's a, we have this rich American music legacy that we're all part of, you know, from, from uh, the blues, which turned into rock and roll and jazz and split into all this amazing music that the world knows into rap and hip hop and, you know, R and B. And it's just this, we have this incredibly rich musical legacy in our country. And, um, it's, it's, it's great to be part of it. So Paige, you mentioned that you're a big fan of jazz and that jazz has been a large influence on you and your music. How exactly did you get into jazz music? I came to jazz almost accidentally as I had a teacher. My very first teacher uh, wouldn't teach me Stairway to Heaven. So I moved on from him and got another teacher who would teach me Stairway to Heaven. And he was also having to be a jazz guitarist. And he said, and he, so he started kind of showing me things. He goes, you know, this music will open you up to all this harmonic information. Uh, and, and my parents would listen to jazz. So I was familiar with it. I hear Ella Fitzgerald and George Shearing and George Benson. And I heard George Benson play guitar. I was like, wow, I didn't even know you could play the guitar like that. You know, because I was like Jimmy Page, uh, Iommi, you know, Angus Malcolm, um, you know, Aerosmith I loved. Um, and so the, I, I started kind of this parallel, these parallel interests. I was working on rock music, but then I started playing jazz. And when I went to college, decided to audition for the music school, my um my second year, um, there's not really a you know, university. They don't have a rock guitar program. So I, just, I got into classical guitar and jazz guitar, both simultaneously. I had separate teachers for each. And I was studying everything, music theory, composition, uh, history, all those things. And uh, I just fell in love with the music and dug deeper and deeper and deeper into it. Kind of pushed rock to the background for a while, while I got my degree. And um, then when I auditioned in New York, uh, at Manhattan School of Music for my master's degree, um, I finished school and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm still into all this music. And as I said, I, I auditioned for Banna Susan's and Glenn Branca's group. And they kind of turned me on to cool rock music, you know, like later punk stuff. And um, I realized, wow, there's, there's a lot of cool things you can do with the guitar that uh, haven't been done before still. And, and Robert Post from Banna Susan's turned me on to using distortion. Uh, so I, some, somewhere in there, my kind of rhythmic sense, my harmonic sense um, and feel is Helmet sort of has this. I, I, the great musician Danny Korchmar and another great musician Steve Jordan said, you're like a heavy group that's, that grooves. You guys swing. It's got this great feel. Um, and I think it comes from just, you know, listening to music that, that grooves like that. And uh, that's what jazz is about. I talked to an old jazz piano player. What are you playing on stomping at the Savoy? You know, there's, there's not many chord changes. And he said, I'm just trying to swing, man. And that's like, to me, the, you know, feel is, you know, so the, I mean, the elements of music is essentially are, you know, um, melody, harmony, rhythm, the form, the structure, whatever, and the text, if you're writing words. And it's all the same throughout throughout music. So it's, it's uh, with Helmet, I started kind of expanding. I was hearing things walking around in my head and I would have to de uh, you know, drop tune the guitar. And so I started hearing all these, uh, hearing and finding all these voicings that were kind of jazz voicings, you know, minus the thirds. And uh, so that's kind of, there's a, those elements, the harmonic thing and exploration definitely influenced Helmet. The, the feel thing, the, the kind of my, se my sense of uh, improvisation when I play a solo, there's this combination of kind of feedback that I started to work with with Robert. Um, and, and, you know, you could analyze things like, oh, he's superimposing a B flat triad over a D minor mode. Um, and there's, there are things that are there. If you go in retrospect, I'll look back. I don't think like that when I'm playing, but I practice that kind of stuff all the time. So it somehow started creeping into the music. And, uh, um, yeah, I just, I love, and it's a great, jazz is a great thing to, to, to sit, you know, sit down every morning and pick, you know, pick up and kind of start with. So country and rock both have the blues and jazz in them. If you listen to a guitar, a, a, a genius guitar player like Jerry Reed, who's a country, considered a country guy, he's got a huge jazz influence, as did Chet Atkins, you know, those cats, Roy Clark, they could shred. I mean, they knew their... They knew their shit, too. You know what I mean? Those guys weren't. They knew the fretboard, you know, and jazz will like say, OK, I'm gonna, I need to know all five positions of a pentatonic scale or a alter dominant scale or, you know, you, you have to use the whole fretboard arpeggios for, you know, F major, you know, but -da -da -da, -da 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 -da, all the way up. The, and those cats knew that. And and amazingly, 
the Beatles too, though they weren't like you wouldn't say they were, you know, shredders. To, they knew their they knew what they were doing. Like, you know, through learning songs like they had, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to go to the relative major here, uh, relative minor here in the bridge or, or vice versa. Or, or they, you know, uh, they studied songs. So they weren't just about, you know, uh, Chuck Berry or whatever and, and the, the blues. And I mean, well, I've had this conversation last night with my one of my best friends about how Howlin' Wolf is kind of predates Chuck Berry for inventing rock and roll. And he's like kind of the first rock star, really, you know. Uh, oh, my phone's dying here. Let me plug it in. You know, if I'm starting beginning uh, guitar lessons, like with the nine-year-old, I'm not going to get into jazz with him. I'm still trying to show him a C chord, you know, and he's got, he's a kid. So the guitar neck looks kind of big. And so I'm like, how can I, what chords can I teach you? E minor is the top three strings open. C is the top three strings with the first fret, second string. You know, like G7, I can teach him that, you know, with the F, you know, it's like, and, and so it's, it's really interesting. It's fun to kind of think about how to, you know, turn a, turn a kid on to music and how to get him excited about. And when you learn one thing and that's all it takes. Once I learned that a, you know, an F minor six chord was a D minor seven flat five, uh, my mind was blown. I'm like, oh my, it's the same exact notes except for, you know, so that means every F minor six I know can be exchanged for every D minor seven flat five and vice versa. And then you're like, oh, you know, you can take it one step further. I can play like, a, you know, a dominant chord, you know, and it's, you know, you can get really carried away. And But I love that. I love those connections. It's, it's to me, it's kind of, what I'm talking about, about how music is a unifying thing, it's this, it's the universe. It's the way things connect. And it's like all human beings, we're all connected. And it's, it's, we're not divided. It's not, and music is a, is like those connections to me are, it's like this, you know, and I sound too much like a hippie, but I did grow up in Oregon and go to University of Oregon and have Birk, Birkenstocks in the seventies, you know, it, it, it's, that those connections fascinate me and it's and it's and the connection that i felt when i'm listening to something when i heard a love supreme by coltrane and i couldn't stop listening to it and i went to another place i i left the physical universe and i and music i remember the first time i was playing with guys in school that i that i loved that didn't judge me because i was bad we were playing a c minor blues oliver nelson and I, everything stopped I was everything stopped because I didn't have to use my brain because the changes are easy, you know, C, F, G. And all of a sudden was improvising with these with my and it's, something took me out. I went out of this, you know, brain and went to this beautiful, amazing place. And that's what music it, it, it does. And those connections and that kind of universe, you know, the, the, the universe, it's really exciting and really interesting. And what? You know, what else is there? You know, the physical world, we all exist in this. You know, you wake up, you make your coffee, you, you know, you eat food, you, you, uh, you go to the store. You, I mean, it's not that interesting, really. You know what I mean? So there's, we, we're, there's got to be something beyond that. And that's, you know, the connection we feel with certain people. You know, you can meet somebody and you've never seen them in your life and you can click like that with them and other people you can know them your whole life and have nothing in common and not be able to really carry on a you know a conversation that's not forced so it's it's really interesting to me hey guys thanks for watching if you like this video make sure to subscribe for more because there is a lot more to come all the videos on my channel are original i'm the one filming editing and conducting all the interviews so if you guys like what you see and you want to support the best way to do so is honestly just to subscribe thanks for watching